Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman. We're taking a look today at another mini PC, but this one is Ryzen powered. This is the Asus PN50, and the one they sent us has a Ryzen 4800U processor inside, but there are a few other processor configurations available as well. And we're going to take a closer look at this little mini PC and what you can do with it in just a second. But I do want to let you know in the interest of full disclosure that this came in on loan from Asus. So when we're done with this, it goes back to them. All the opinions you're about to hear are my own. No one is paying for this review, nor is anyone reviewing or approving what you're about to see before it was uploaded. So let's get into it now and see what this little computer is all about. Now the price point on this starts at around $430 for a bare bones kit. That one has a Ryzen 4500U processor, but you have to bring your own RAM and storage into the mix to get things working. Uh, the one they sent us for review is their top end model. This has a Ryzen 4800U processor with 16 gigs of RAM and dual channel configuration and a 512 gigabyte NVMe storage drive on board. Now, one thing that I noticed on this when we did our benchmarks is that it performs pretty close to similarly equipped laptops we've looked at with these Ryzen processors. So I think when we get into some of the benchmarks, you'll see where some of the lower end models might perform versus this one. It was very close to what we saw on similarly equipped laptops. So let's dive into the hardware here and see what we've got. Uh, we've got a headphone microphone jack here on the front, SD card reader here as well, a USB port, which is a five gigabit per second USB-A. Right here, you've got an infrared receiver, and apparently this will work also with HDMI CEC, so you could use this as a way of controlling your home theater system, for example. I was not able to figure out a way to do that, there wasn't any software included that allowed for that. I might revisit that feature in an upcoming video because it was of interest to a few viewers on a live stream the other day. Uh, right here, you've got a USB Type-C port. And this port is a data port, of course, but it can also support display output. And you can run up to an 8K display out of this thing. And what's cool about it is that it actually has three more display options on the back. Uh, so if you look on the rear of the device here, we've got an HDMI output, we have another USB Type-C port that supports display out. And then this model has a display port output as well. And apparently this section here can have different ports configured in it. So there's a version of this with a serial port. I think they've got another one maybe with an HDMI port or another LAN adapter. So you might see different things in this spot depending on which one of these you're looking at. Uh, but this one came equipped with DisplayPort. Now, as to the types of displays that this supports, you should be able to use most of the high-frequency monitors like the 144 hertz models out there. There's going to be a realistic limit, especially for gaming, as to how many frames per second this thing can generate. Uh, but for 2D work, if you have a high frame rate monitor, you should be fine here, and you can have four monitors coming out of it all at the same time. Uh, you have gigabit ethernet here that work fine in our testing additionally you've got two more usb a ports here on the back and then your power goes in here it is not possible to power this with the usb type c connectors there is a kensington lock here on the side so you can prevent it from walking away with you there nothing on this side my only gripe with the industrial design here is that the power button is in a spot that i keep pushing every time i'm adjusting the device on my desk it's kind of a hairpin trigger here it does shut down properly. It kind of signals Windows to shut down. But nonetheless, I have hit this by accident now a number of times as I was playing with it. Uh, you can mount this on the back of a monitor. There was a Visa mount included with the kit that Asus sent me. So if you want to put it out of the way, uh, you can certainly do that. Now, it's very easy to get into the device. You just unscrew the four screws at the bottom and slide the case off. Inside, you will find the two sticks of RAM that they had pre-installed and the NVMe storage. Uh, they also have a SATA slot, so you can add in an additional solid-state drive if you want for a total of two. And of course, the NVMe drive is going to be a lot faster than the SATA drive, but it's nice to have additional storage options inside of the unit. But you can't upgrade the processor on this, so whatever chip you choose at the outset is the one you'll have for the duration of your ownership. It doesn't support eGPUs either because it doesn't have Thunderbolt on board. So if you wanted to hook up an external GPU to your mini PC, an Intel solution is probably going to be better for that. 
One other note here for those of you that might be looking at running this as a Plex server, which is a personal media server that we talk about quite a bit here on the channel, and in full disclosure, Plex is an occasional sponsor here as well. Uh, this won't work well as a Plex server because it doesn't support hardware transcoding. That's a feature that is limited at the moment at least to Intel processors with QuickSync technology or an NVIDIA GPU-based system. And this, of course, has neither an NVIDIA GPU nor an Intel processor inside. And as such, it's probably not going to work well as a Plex media server, especially if you're going to do a lot of hardware transcoding. Now, it does have a wireless radio built in that supports Wi-Fi 6 and Bluetooth. Both of those things work fine in our testing. This is not a fanless device. And as you can see, there's a lot of venting on it. Uh, one thing that you'll notice is the fan will be on quite a bit, but it doesn't make all that much noise. The unit though does get pretty warm and we'll talk more about its thermal performance as we work our way a little further into the review. So let's plug this thing in now. Let's boot it up and see how it performs doing a whole bunch of different types of tasks. All right, let's take a look and see how this does web browsing. We'll pull up the Google Chrome browser and visit the nasa.gov homepage. And as you can see, everything is super fast and responsive. Now, of course, we are on Ethernet, but with the Wi-Fi 6, it'll be pretty close to what you're seeing here. So lots of uh, decent performance here for doing web browsing and all the other stuff that you might do in an office or a productivity environment. Now, a little bit earlier, I connected the computer up to a 4K 60 hertz display, and we played back some YouTube content at 4K at 60 frames per second, and it did pretty well. There was a handful of drop frames, but nothing significant here. So was able to play back a pretty demanding stream from YouTube just fine. So I think overall for web browsing and watching media and whatnot, it should do fine with all of that. Let's take a look now at Zoom. All right, so we've got a Zoom call going on right now. I've got the Huddle Cam HD that we looked at recently that in full disclosure, PTZ Optics sent us to review. Now, of course, there's no built-in camera on this thing. So you do have to have an external webcam to work with it, uh, but it seems to be working here just fine. Uh, doing a little test Zoom call. So all together, uh, not bad for conferencing or any other basic kinds of work tasks that you might do with it. And on the browserbench.org speedometer test, we got a score of 129.4. That puts it very close to what we saw out of a Lenovo Legion 5 gaming laptop with a similar Ryzen processor. Also take a look at the Ryzen 4500U-based Flex 5 from Lenovo, and that'll give you an idea as to what kind of performance you might get out of the mid-range version of the PN50 here. So all in, good performance, and certainly on par with anything you might find on the Intel side, especially for doing work like conferencing and word processing and spreadsheets and all that kind of stuff. Let's move on now to some fun stuff, some gaming. All right, let's kick things off with some GTA 5. We were running at lowest settings, 1080p, and we were doing about 50 frames per second. It was usually in the 45 to 50 frames per second territory there. So not bad, definitely playable and on par with other recent Ryzen-based laptops we've looked at. You can, of course, get a higher frame rate at a lower resolution. So if you went down to 720p, you could definitely get to around 60 frames per second or so. Uh, we also ran The Witcher 3. Uh, here we were getting about 25 to 30 frames per second. So again, this would run a little better uh, at 720p, but here at 1080p with the lowest settings, it's definitely playable and very close to 30 frames per second. So that was running as expected. Uh, we also ran Star Wars Squadrons. Somebody on the live stream wanted to check that out the other day. Uh, 1080p, low settings, we were getting about 40 to 45 frames per second. So definitely very playable. And again, 720p would do a little better. Uh, we also, of course, had to run Fortnite. And here we were at medium settings with the 3D resolution set to 100%. And we were getting between 50 and 55 frames per second or thereabouts. So another playable game here on this platform. And then we ran the 2016 version of Doom. And this was at 1080p lowest settings with the Vulkan API. And there we were getting between 45 and 50 frames per second. So you can definitely get playable 1080p game experiences on here but you'll probably want to run at 720p to get into the 60 frames per second territory with most of the games that we checked out. And of course, we ran the GameCube emulator Dolphin, and that ran just fine as expected. It runs fine on other Ryzen-based devices, and this one did equally well with that. So you've got a lot of fun games that you can play on here, 
at decent frame rates even though it doesn't have a GPU. And that's one of the strengths of these new Ryzen-based processors. They are tremendously good at graphically intensive tasks. And if you're doing things like video editing and photo editing, those tasks can benefit from this. And of course, gaming benefits as well. And on the 3D Mark Time Spy benchmark test, we got a score of 1,144. Now, as I mentioned at the outset, the mid-range of the PN50 mini PC that we're looking at here uh, runs with a 4500U processor, and you can see what the Flex 5 there does on the chart, and that is largely what you can expect out of the 4500U version of this particular computer. And on the 3D Mark stress test, we got a failing grade of 90.6%. 97% is a passing grade, and that was actually the best score we could muster out of this device. And that test runs one of those graphical benchmarks over and over again to see whether or not the CPU slows down when it's under heavy sustained load. What happens when the fan can't keep it cool enough is it will actually make the processor run slower to prevent overheating. Now we did go through the BIOS settings here. There is a option called CPU QFAN, and by default, it's on normal mode, and we switched it to performance mode, and that didn't make much of a difference at all. And the fan actually is pretty quiet throughout, and I think that's the problem. It looks like they really wanted to keep the fan noise at a minimum, but that does come at the cost of performance. Now, one workaround here is to disable their Q fan feature completely, but when you disable it, it runs the fan at full blast, and it is pretty loud when it is disabled. So I think they could probably fix this problem by making a BIOS tweak to allow performance mode to kick the fan up to full speed when it needs to. And I think that will give it much better consistent performance under load because right now we were not able to get this thing to run consistently without some degree of thermal throttling. The fan's quiet, but of course that comes at the cost of performance. And if you're curious about its power consumption, we were drawing about 46 watts or so when we placed it under heavy load and about 16 watts at idle. All right, one last thing to check out, and that is its Linux performance. We booted up Ubuntu 20.10, and everything worked just fine. It detected all the hardware on the computer, including Wi-Fi, audio, video, Bluetooth. It all worked, no problem, and it was a very snappy experience on the Linux side as it was on Windows, so no problems there. Uh, we've seen very good Linux performance actually on a lot of these Ryzen-based devices we've looked at, and this one is equally good. So it's great to see more of these Ryzen-based mini PCs make their way to market. The performance on here is very good and on par with what we've seen out of similarly equipped laptops. And on the subject of laptops, you might want to look at what laptops cost with the same specs as this one, because you might save some money and get the same performance. I am concerned about the thermal issues we talked about a few minutes ago on this. I think they're correctable with a BIOS update. That fan just needs to run at full blast when it's under heavy load, and right now it does not. And I think if they can correct that, that'll probably solve a lot of the thermal issues we were having with it. But beyond that, if you're in the market for a Ryzen-based mini PC, I think this one is certainly worth taking a look at, provided they're able to patch those thermal issues up. That's going to do it for now. Until next time, this is Lon Seidman. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters Brian Parker, Jim Peter, Tom Albrecht, Frank Lewandowski, Mark Bollinger, and Chris Allegretta. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.